Good morning again. Good and, uh, morning. Welcome to uh, True Grace Bible Ministry. Yeah, my name is Mike Marcheski, and it's uh, nice to have you folks out there. Nice to have you folks here. So we're going to continue on with um, some teaching in the Bible. And what we believe to be the key to understanding the Scriptures is right here. Study the show they self-approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And when we rightly divide the word of truth, it's not truth from error, but truth from truth. Okay? And we don't rightly divide the word of God from Old Testament, from New Testament, but the key to understanding the scripture and when we rightly divide it is between prophecy God dealing with Israel and the revelation of the mystery which is to the body of Christ. That's how we should rightly divide the word of truth. So that's what we're going to continue doing and that's what we're going to do today. And we're going to rightly divide this phrase due time or due times. Okay? And we see it being mentioned four times in scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 8, Romans chapter 5 verse 6, uh, Titus chapter 1 verses 1 to 3 and 1st Timothy chapter 2 verses 3 to 6 okay and the first one we're going to take a look at is out of 1st Corinthians 15 verse 8 because that's where it starts with our Apostle Paul so let's turn to 1st Corinthians 15 we're going to start at verse 1 though and as we're going to look at the Apostle Paul and this phrase due time and how it applies we'll to him. It. First Corinthians 15. Uh, we'll just drop mm -hmm. in verse 1. And then we're going to look at the due times that Paul talks about. And remember, the key to understanding Scripture is right division between prophecy and the mystery. So First Corinthians 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory that I preached unto you, unless you, have re unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So here we see that Paul says, this is the gospel that we have to believe today to be saved. There is no other gospel. And I think we, we talked about that last week. This is the gospel message. The death, burial, and resurrection a person must believe to be saved. There's nothing else. So if somebody's out there teaching something else or, or saying we have to repent, be baptized, or follow the commandments, or ask Jesus into your heart, or give your life to God, or, or something else, I, I don't know how to say it anyway, but it, that, that's wrong. This is the gospel we have to believe to be saved. The death, burial, and resurrection. So, as we continue on now, verse 5. It says, and he was seen of Cephas. He's talking about after he was raised from the dead, okay? In verse 4, that he rose again the third day. He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. So more than 500 people seen him. Of whom the great part remain unto this present, but some have fallen asleep. So what he's saying, most people were still alive at the time when Paul wrote this but some have died. And that's what that phrase, fallen asleep, means. Some have died. It's not soul sleep. they died. Uh, where are we at? We're in verse 7. After that, he was seen of James and all of the apostles. Now, verse 8. This is the verse we're going to springboard off of today. And, last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. So, First of all, we want to see here in verse 8, it says, And last of all, he was seen of me. So, according to that scripture, I have no problem with saying that the Apostle Paul was the last individual to see the risen Savior. Before he went to glory. Well, I shouldn't say before, but he was the last one to see him in his glorified state as he is now sitting on the throne of heaven. I think that's a better way of stating it. Okay, but Paul was the last one to see him, wasn't he? And he, Because he says it right here, and last of all, he was seen of me. Okay. 
Okay, now, there's been questions about, well, did the Apostle Paul see the risen Savior? Did Paul see the Lord face to face? And I believe he did, not just by this verse, because he says, last of all, he was seen of me. But we're going to chase some things down. We'll look at see that Paul did indeed see the Lord face to face. So, go to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. And we're going to jump into verse 15. Again, this is uh, in Acts chapter 26 where Paul is before King Agrippa and he's rehearsing or going over what happened on the road to Damascus. And in verse 15 he says, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. So, this is right here, the Lord talking to Paul, and he's telling him that rise and stand on thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, and then he tells him what the purpose is, to make thee a minister and witness, both of the things which thou hast seen, seen, and those things in which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, and for what reason? To open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. So, here's what the Lord said to him is, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. Okay? This is very, very plain of what uh, the risen Lord told Paul when he see him face to face. Now, go to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22, verse 12. Again, uh, Paul rehearsing what was happening on the road to Damascus uh, with the chief captain. And in verse 12, he tells him, he says, And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee, that thou should know his will, and see the just one, and should hear the voice of of his mouth, for thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. So here we see that Ananias telling Paul that he's a chosen vessel of God to know his will, and that he should be a witness to all men of what he has seen. So here we're seeing that Paul indeed seen the Lord face to face. Now. And these were both at his conversion. Um, we're going to continue on here in Acts chapter 22. I just want to verify some things that we've been talking about uh, for the last month or so. and Maybe this will clear it up. But this again is Paul seeing the Lord face to face in a vision. Okay, So it goes hand in hand with what we're talking about today. That last of all he was seen of me. All right. Now, verse 17 of Acts 22. And it came to pass that when I was come up again to Jerusalem, even while in, excuse me, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance. And I saw him saying unto me, Make haste, get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. So Paul was in Jerusalem, he was praying in the temple, and he was in a trance, and he seen the risen Savior, didn't he? And the risen Savior told him to get out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive his testimony about the Lord. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by and consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, this is what the Lord Jesus said to Paul, Depart 
I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. He doesn't say anything about saying, I will send you um, to the far hence Gentiles. No, no, no. Okay. Um, I'm not being rude or sarcastic, okay? But there's times I'm not smarter than a fifth grader. But I was taught to read early on, and I know it says that he will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles, not to the far hence Gentiles. Enough of that. Okay? So, he seen the Lord in this vision. But the thing is, when did this vision take place? We know he was in Jerusalem, okay? But I don't believe it took place when they said it did in around Acts chapter 20 when he went back uh, the f what, fourth or fifth time into Jerusalem. I believe it was the first time he went to Jerusalem. Because if we look at Galatians, I believe it's very clear when this vision happened and the Lord told him to go to the Gentiles in Galatians chapter 1. Or 17. Paul says, this is after he, um, and we're going to save that. We're going to read those verses later. We're just going to go right to verse 17. He says, Neither I went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went unto Arabia, where he went, I believe he went to see the Lord for uh, revelation, and returned again unto Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. So, according to what Paul is saying here in Acts chapter, or excuse me, in Galatians chapter 1, he went to the Arabian Desert, he went to Damascus, then he went to Jerusalem, didn't he? And that's not, nothing different than what Paul says in Acts chapter 26. Okay? Nothing different than what he says in Acts chapter 26. In verse 19, he says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus, and at Jerusalem, and throughout all the coasts of Judea, then to the Gentiles that should repent and turn to God and do the works meet for repentance. See, after the Apostle Paul received his vision, he went to Arabia, he went to Damascus, then after three years, he went to Jerusalem. So he spent three years, I believe, in Damascus preaching this uh, message that Jesus was the Son of God. And we see that in Acts chapter uh, 9, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. And so Paul, I believe, was there for three years. Then he went to Jerusalem. And when he went to Jerusalem after three years, this is the vision that we just got done reading in Acts chapter 22, when he says to go far hence to the Gentiles. See, it's all these same accounts in consecutive, um, I don't want to say order, because there was a split time in there, okay? But if we see that Paul got saved and the things that he's talking about in Acts chapter 22 and Acts chapter 26 are the same events that were happening in Acts chapter 9. They coincide with each other. It takes a little time. It takes a little study, okay? But that I just wanted to clear up. But the point of today's message is that last of all, he was seen of me. And Acts chapter 22, Acts chapter 26 shows that Paul did indeed see the risen Savior, didn't he? Uh, a few more passages to, um, to support that, that he did see the risen Savior in Acts chapter 18, verse 9, when Paul seen the risen Savior again. Uh, then spake the Lord to Paul in, the, in night by a vision. And this is when he was in, uh, in Corinth. Be not afraid, but speak. And hold thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall sit on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in the city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So here again in Acts chapter 18, we see he had a vision from the Lord. He's seen the Lord face to face. 
uh, Acts chapter 27. Verse 22 and 26. It says, Now I ex exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. This is when Paul was shipwrecked. Uh, for there, sh there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, whom I serve. So, again, I believe the risen Lord, the angel, the messenger of God, is the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given, given thee all them that sail with thee. Well, for sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told to me. So here again, we see support that Paul did see the risen Savior. Now, that goes right hand in hand with what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 8, doesn't it? When he says that last of all, he, he excuse me, and last of all, he was seen of me also. So we see that Paul did indeed see the risen Savior, and that he said he would come to visions later in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So let's just take a look at that while we're going through. We may as well. 2 Corinthians 12, when Paul says in verse 1, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. So here's when I believe Paul was caught up to the third heaven, uh, received revelation for the body of Christ, and this very well could be when he went into the Arabian desert, because we see he was lowered down into a basket, and then Acts 9 talks about Jonah being lowered down into the basket, and it seems that they, they coincide with each other. Um, I'm not 100% sure on this, but I'm leaning toward the fact that when Paul got revelation from the Lord, he got them all at one time. He gave them to us, chronological, I shouldn't say chronological, excuse me, he gave them to us progressively, but I believe the Lord gave him all revelation at one time. Because even these visions that we looked at here, um, they weren't about getting revelation. Okay, I believe what we're going to look at next is about revelation, but those other visions had nothing to do with receiving revelation from the body of Christ to church. So, I'm more leaning that Paul received all revelation at one time, but gave them to us progressively. Uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. And Paul says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. So that's why I, you know, kind of stand on that, because even that passage we looked at here in verse 17, where he says, "I went to Arabia and returned again unto Damascus." Then, after three years, see, I know uh, most teach that Paul was in the Arabian desert three years, but it doesn't say that, does it? It says that then after three years, after three years he was in Damascus. I don't think we know how long he was in Arabia. Because the scripture doesn't say, does it? So I don't think we can put the three years into Arabia. But, you know, that's what I see that. That's a different, uh, maybe something else we can look at in the future. But we see now that as of, Paul says that he was last seen of me. Okay? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 15 8. And last of all, he was seen of me also. So I think we just went through there and verified that fact, that Paul did see the risen Savior. Now, let's look at the second part of that verse. As of one born out of due time. Like one born out of due time. Now, you know, I, I've researched this and um, every commentator, every commentary, that I've seen, every teaching on this, other than you know those that do rightly divide the word of truth. They say that this due time, as of one born out of due time, they're talking that Paul was 
born at an untimely or premature point in his life. I'm not sure if I agree with that. Okay? And what they say is, you know, and they relate it to Israel's future, that he should have been born at a later time because he was a Jew, he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, Philippians um, uh, chapter 3 tells us all about, you know, Paul's testimony there when he says, I was a Pharisee in the Hebrew of Hebrews, and such and such. Okay, so they want to put this passage that he was born out of due time, meaning he, he was born at an untimely point in his life and should have been born later. But, I disagree with that, okay? And again, when we rightly divide the word of truth, prophecy for mystery, I think this due time, um, born out of due time, will see that that's not what he was speaking of. So, I do not believe that there was anything untimely about Paul's birth. Nothing at all. And to verify that, go back to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. And we'll read verse 11 again. Uh, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which preached of me was not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Verse 14. And I profited and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Verse 15 now. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him, Jesus Christ, um, Him, the Son of God, among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. See, Paul was not born prematurely or at an untimely point in his life, was he? He was born right where God wanted him. When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, when Paul was still in his mother's womb, is when God separated him to preach and to reveal the Son of God in him and to preach it to the Gentiles. See, Paul was chosen to know God's will. And he was separated from his mother's womb. So to say, <coughs> excuse me, to say that he was born untimely or, or prematurely, and that he should have been born at a later time when the nation of Israel uh, would be coming into the kingdom is is not true. And the reason these guys teach that is because they do not rightly divide the word of truth. They don't know what to do with this due time. They don't know when the due time is, or when it was to be and when it will be. Yes, it's future for Israel, but what we need to look at is this due time. Okay, we're going to do that here in a minute. But first we want to continue on to see about what Paul says here, that he was not, he was uh, separated from his mother's womb. He is a chosen vessel. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. And he was chosen from his mother's womb. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. And see, that's the same thing Paul says in verse 16 of Galatians 1. To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. The heathen, the Gentiles, are the same individuals. Okay? So, and the Apostle Paul. Was, was he out of the will of God, as some teach, that he made these things up, that he is the apostle to the Gentiles? And believe it or not, folks, it's out there. I, I've seen some of it, okay? That what Paul did and what he said, uh, he's a false teacher, he's a heretic, and he made all this stuff up. But I don't believe that to be true, because if we look at Ephesians, I mean, so far we've seen there in, uh, in Acts, uh, chapter 22. Let me just remind us of what we read in Acts chapter 22, okay? 
in verse 14, and he said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee that thou should knowest his will and see the just one and should hear the voice of his mouth. Okay? And in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. So Paul is an apostle by the will of God. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. So, Paul was a chosen vessel by God. He, by the commandment of God, by the will of God, he is our apostle. He did not do this on his own. Okay? And Paul, again, is born out of due time. He was born right where God wanted him. God's timing is always perfect, isn't it? So, I guess what we need to do then is uh, define this due time. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul says... Last of all he was seen last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. So that phrase as of one born out of due time, don't you think it would be good to define the due time that Paul's talking about, saying like he was born one out of due time. So that's what we're gonna do. We're going to define what Paul means by as of one born out of due time. What is the due time that Paul's speaking of? So, go to Mark chapter 1, and we're going to see what Paul's talking about as of one born out of due time. He never says that he is born one out of due time. It says as one born out of due time. So, Mark chapter 1 verse 14, and we're going to see what the due time is that Paul is speaking about. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now, after that John, John the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand Repent ye and believe the gospel. So Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom. That's the only message Jesus ever preached. He never preached the gospel of the grace of God. He never said, if you believe that I'm going to die for you and be buried and rise again, that you're going to go to heaven. He never preached that. Okay? He never preached that for the people in the dispensation of grace. He preached the gospel of the kingdom. But now, he says, the time is fulfilled. What time is he talking about? Again, go back to 2 Samuel. Uh, as I've said many times, what is, what is the mother of all learning? It's repetition. I know we've looked at these verses many times, okay? But, um, as I've been taught, it takes somebody 16 times to hear something before they fully comprehend it. So, I'm not sure if we've covered this 16 times yet. But if we have... Well, that's okay. As they say, the more the merrier. Okay, it's not going to hurt us any. Repetition is the mother of all learning. So, when Jesus said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. What's he talking about? 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 10. He says, moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and plant them, and they may dwell in the place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time I have commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the, the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. And verse 12. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thee up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So here, back in Samuel, uh, Samuel is 
telling you, David, that in the future, when the days be fulfilled, there will be a kingdom and there will be a throne set up forever. Now, Jesus is saying the time is fulfilled. So Jesus is talking about what happened back there in Samuel. Okay? Now, remember what we're trying to do here. We're, we're, we're trying to bring out what this due time is that Paul is talking about. And when we see these phrases, we must rightly divide them. Again, understanding Scripture properly is between prophecy and the mystery. So, here we see the time is fulfilled. That's why Jesus came to earth to set up this earthly kingdom. And we looked at a few weeks. That was the purpose of his resurrection, that he would resurrect to sit on the throne of David. Okay? That is part of the due time. As of one born out of due time. See, the due time for Israel was when Christ came to earth to set up an earthly kingdom. Our due time that we're going to look at in the next few weeks is a little bit different. See, even though there's similarities, similarities are not the same. So the due time for Israel was the kingdom. And that's going to be future, yes. But the time was fulfilled when Jesus was here, isn't it? Wasn't it, I should say. And if they would have accepted their Messiah, he would have set up this kingdom. Now, as of one born out of due time, Matthew chapter 10, We've seen that Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So he's an apostle. He's a chosen vessel of God. There was also other chosen individuals of God, weren't there? And these are the twelve apostles. Now, verse uh, 1 of chapter 10. And when he had called upon... Excuse me. And when he had called upon him, his twelve disciples... He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Wow. Too bad we can't do that today. Now, the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Labaius, whose surname is Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So here we see the calling and the choosing of the twelve apostles. Paul's not in there, is he? Okay. Paul's not in there. Okay. As of one born out of due time. Verse 5. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not unto the way of the Gentiles are, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, these twelve preached the same message that Jesus preached. Why? Because the time was fulfilled, and that Jesus was coming to set up this earthly kingdom. And this is what the twelve preached. Okay? Now, Keeping that in mind here, okay, the calling out of the twelve. Let, let's go to Matthew 19 and, and look at some things here. And hopefully we're bringing this all together and it makes a little sense to you of why I'm going where I'm going with these things. Uh, Matthew 19, 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and have followed thee. What shall we have? Therefore, verse 28, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, They that which have followed me, in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of David, of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay. This is why I'm coming here now. And this is why we're talking about the twelve. Remember, Paul says, as of one born out of due time. Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. And the twelve are asking him, well, what's, what's in it for us? And he tells them, when he comes into his glory and he's sitting on the throne, that they will be 
sitting on the thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay? Paul doesn't fit in there, does he? Because here, here's a little example, if you would. There's twelve tribes. And some say Paul should have been the thirteenth apostle. Or Paul should have uh, replaced Matthias. And he should have been the twelfth. But that's not so. And that's not so. All right. See, Paul was as of one born out of due time. Here we have 12 apostles and 12 tribes. Now, let's turn the page a little bit to the dispensation of the grace of God. Okay? For we have all been baptized into one body. There's one body of Christ. And how many apostles do we have today? But one. Oh. Yeah. So do you see it? One body, one apostle. Twelve tribes, twelve apostles. And as of one born out of due time, because what they say is, you know, Paul should have been included into these twelves. But that's not so. If we rightly divide and we understand what the scripture is talking about, that Paul's a chosen vessel to the Gentiles. And when we keep prophecy separated from the revelation of the mystery, it makes sense. And now, hopefully, we're seeing what Paul says, as of one born out of due time. Um, the due time he was talking about was for Israel and the setting up of the kingdom. Now, remember I just made a statement that... Um, the Apostle Paul should have been the 13th uh, Apostle, or he should have replaced, um, uh, excuse me, he should have, he should have replaced uh, Judas. But that's not so either. You know, and think about this. Some say that Peter and the boys, they, they were hasty and, and made a bad decision when they hurried up and got Matthias in there in uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, uh, as the 12th Apostle. But didn't we just read here in, in Matthew that the twelve apostles are going to sit on the twelve thrones and judge the twelve tribes of Israel? I mean, these guys were fishermen, but they weren't dummies. Mm -hmm. And they knew that the time was fulfilled, that the kingdom of God was at hand, meaning that this was their Messiah, he's the son of the living God, and that he came to set up this earthly kingdom. But there was something that couldn't happen for these guys because they only had 11. That's why it, you know, to some that they, they pushed Matthias into this spot. But that's not true. It was according to God's will. And all these guys knew was about the kingdom, didn't they? Because what was kept secret since the world began? The revelation of the mystery, the body of Christ. And that's why they were in such a hurry, okay, to get the twelfth apostle. Because without twelve, they couldn't sit on the thrones. And that is just, not only is a biblical sense, but that's common sense. Because that's how you and I would think today as well. If God told us we needed, uh, you know, ten people to accomplish something, we'd go out and get the tenth person, wouldn't we? Yeah, because we want it to, uh, we want it to be accomplished. So, uh, again, as of one born out of due time, let, let, let's go to Acts uh, chapter 1. And what we're trying to do here is show what this due time is that as of one born out of due time. See, the due time for Israel was the kingdom. The kingdom. And we're going to look at the due time and the due times for us in the dispensation of grace in the next few weeks. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 6. Again, it says, When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So they were still all concerned about this kingdom, weren't they? That's all they knew about. They didn't know anything about this dispensation of grace. So this due time was all about the kingdom. Uh, look at Acts chapter 3. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his holy prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which was preached 
unto you. So here it is, the offer of the kingdom. If they would have accepted their Messiah, that time would have been fulfilled because back there in Jesus' earthly ministry, that was the announcement of the kingdom. And here is Peter giving the legitimate offer. If they would accept their Messiah, they would repent of who Jesus of Nazareth is. Their sins would be blotted out uh, when the time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall say in Jesus Christ, which was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So all this, okay, is in accordance to that due time. The due time for Israel was about this kingdom. Okay? As of one born out of due time. Not prematurely or untimely because God's timing was perfect. Okay, Because he is our apostle. He's the apostle of the Gentiles. He did not or should not have been included in with the twelve. But this due time is all about this kingdom. Uh, let's keep reading in Acts chapter 3. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you, brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things, whatever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Verse 24. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel, and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Talk about the kingdom, isn't it? Verse 25, ye are the children of the prophets. There's nobody in the body of Christ, a child of the prophets. And of the covenants, we're not children of the covenants either, which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, and turning away every one of you from his iniquity. See, that's what would have happened if we go back and we look at um, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. This is fulfillment of the new covenant. If they would have accepted their Messiah, this new covenant would have came into fruition, right? Uh, go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, 31, page 678. It says, Behold, the days come, and saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this covenant, this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and be their God. They shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me. For the least of them and to the greatest of them, saith the Lord, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So, in Acts chapter 3, the day of Pentecost, and, and, and time to follow, if Israel would have accepted their Messiah, this new covenant would have came into fruition. This is the due time that Paul was saying that as of one born out of due time. See, the due time for Israel was all about this kingdom. He doesn't say he was born out of due time, or he was prematurely or untimely born, but is as one born out of due time. Seemingly, it may be that way, that Paul was born out of due time, but he was not, was he? he? He was separated unto his mother's womb, and he was to preach that Jesus is the Son of God, okay, to the heathen. That's what Galatians tells us. That's what Romans chapter uh, 1, verses 1 to 5 tells us. He was to preach Jesus Christ to all nations. Now, as of one born out of due time. I think, and I hope, I helped to clarify what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, verse 8, when he says that as of, let me read it, in 
1 Corinthians 15, verse 8. And he says, And last of all, he was seen of me. I think we've clearly seen that, that Paul was the last one to see the risen Savior, and he did indeed see the risen Savior face to face. And last of all, he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. So hopefully we clarified that due time. That as of one born out of due time. The due time that he's talking about was about this kingdom. Okay? But we know there's been a change. Okay? We know in Acts chapter 9 that, that Paul is to be a chosen vessel to go to the Gentiles. And in Romans chapter 11. You know what? Let's go to Romans 11 as we wrap up and take a quick take a look at that again to maybe verify some things that are happening to you know let us understand maybe a little bit more about this due time for Israel that Paul is talking about uh, Romans 11 verse 5 see when, when, when Paul is writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15 it's coincide with what is going on in the book of Acts okay um, and during that time of the book of Acts we have Israel diminishing away that there were I know people don't like this phrase but there's two programs going on at the same time that um, the dispensing of the law and the law is still being enforced to the nation of Israel and now the dispensation of grace that is being commissioned to Paul is they're going on side by side and I have no problem with that because that's what the Bible teaches and we see that here in Romans uh, 11 verse 5 uh, even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace now this word remnant uh, that only goes with what God calls the nation of Israel. There's no remnant in the body of Christ. That word remnant is a, if I would, is a, uh, a term associated only with the nation of Israel. So there is a remnant at this present time. And again, when Paul is writing, okay, the things happened, all of these things happened during the book of Acts, okay, yes. But there's two programs going on at the same time. And he says, and if by grace, see, the election is by God's grace. There is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then there's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And he, he's talking about um, the election of grace okay, that God chose. The only elect in the Bible are, are God and the nation of Israel. Remember that, okay? Because in verse 7, he goes on to say, What well, then? Israel have not obtained which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. The election of grace are not Jews within the body of Christ, because there's no remnant in the body of Christ. The election of grace is that little flock, those that, <laughs> that Jesus and Peter and the boys were preaching the gospel of the kingdom to they are the ones that accepted their Messiah. Those are the ones here that the election have obtained it. That uh, First John and, and that Peter and Jude and those books of uh, the Jewish epistles as we call them are written to these folks that have gained a taste of that new covenant. Okay? God gave them a taste of it and that's what we see happening in those Jewish epistles. Alright? Um, but these folks here are not in the body of Christ. This is the little flock. He's still addressing and, and pertaining these things to the nation of Israel. Okay, yes, it's our apostle who is writing this, but he's talking about Israel, not about the body of Christ. Uh, according as it is written, God had given them a spirit of slumber, eyes that should not see, ears that should not hear, unto this day. And David said, Let their table be a snare, a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense unto them, that their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back always. I say that, have they stumbled that they should fall? 
God forbid, but through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? So we've covered this before, that Israel fell at the cross, excuse me, they stumbled at the cross, they fell at the stoning of Stephen, and then the rest of the way through the book of Acts, they diminished away. Okay? And that, and hopefully I'm bringing this in, because what I want to see now, want us to see is this next verse, that Paul says, For I speak to you, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. 